Good afternoon. Welcome to the Children's Museum of Atlanta's Town Square, a series designed for families, educators, and the community to learn about and discuss important issues. This series is one facet of the Children's Museum's goal to serve as a gathering place where all are invited to explore, engage, and learn. We are so fortunate to be able to engage our best and brightest in these conversations that will hopefully enlighten, educate, and in some cases, dispel any myths. October is coming out month, so our Town Square series this month is focused on educating and discussing LGBTQIA topics for parents, educators, and the general community. If you missed any of our past Town Square set conversations, they have been recorded and can be found on our blog, which is located on our website, childrensmuseumatlanta.org, or on our YouTube channel. Again, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box, and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. The purpose of October's Coming Out Month is to recognize the impact that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals have had on history, locally, nationally, and internationally. To honor these contributions, we decided to host these important co educational conversations this October. This week, I am delighted to introduce you to Jasmine Stevens, a teacher at Drew Charter School, and Jonathan Zamaripa, digital coach at the Atlanta International School. I also wanna give a shout out to Courtney Bryant for introducing us to these amazing educators. I've learned a lot from our conversation with them and I hope you will as well. My first question, Jasmine and Jonathan, is I would love to start out by asking you both to talk a little bit about yourself, your work, and why you thought it was important to participate in today's conversation. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Um, thank you for having me. Again, like she said, my name is Jasmine Stevens. I am an academic integration specialist, which is like a really intense team lead and a fourth grade math teacher at Drew Charter School. Um, I thought it was really important to join this conversation today because classrooms are extremely diverse. Um, modern day classrooms are diverse. They're they're, our student makeup is diverse and it goes beyond just race and gender. And I think we need to learn to understand and appreciate and really welcome and have an inclusive classroom. Great, thanks. Um, Jonathan, how about you? Hi, right. so, hey, Karen, thanks again for having me. Um, again, my name is Jonathan Zamaripa and I'm a digital coach at Atlanta International School. But prior to my position, I was a teacher at Drew Charter School. And so I know Jasmine very well and Courtney. So um, as far as why this is important to be here is that, again, piggybacking on what Jasmine said, our society is changed is, and things are changing. And of course, the classrooms need to be an example of that. And so we both have experiences and perspective, perception, perspectives on these environments and being able to have an inclusive environment for our, our students and the next generation. So that's why. Thank you so much again. So Children's Museum, we realize this is a really dense topic. It's that a lot of layers for parents, educators, and the community. Can you both share a little bit about how your personal journey as an educator has been as a member of the LGBTQIA community? Can you tell us a little about your past we talked about? Sure. Um, I can go. Um, so for me, um, I started education at, in the inner city schools of Atlanta, and I was lured to working as a male role model during the time, and I loved the, making an impact with my students when I was there, but this is before I was out, so I wasn't out of the closet at the time, and so then as time went by, I eventually came out of the closet, and so then this idea of being a masculine male role model changed and then the being a gay man on top of that and so for me it was a uh two layers and feeling uh this anxiety over how i was going to be accepted and how i was going my percept how i was going to be perceived by parents and faculty members and and um of course my admin but what ended up happening is at the end of the day i came to realize that it doesn't matter what my gender is or my sexuality. What matters is who I have always been, and that is a empowering my students and being able to care for each individual child that walks into my classroom. And so that what became the more important pertinent thing for me to work on. And so that's a bit of my journey as an educator. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and Jasmine, what about your journey? 
Um, as for me, it so Drew is the second school that I've taught at. And my first school, it really, my sexual orientation, how I identify, just never felt like something I needed to discuss. Um, it was just teach. Uh, it was teach, teach, teach. Um, made coworker friends and things like that. But I just never felt comfortable, essentially, to really talk about, you know, how I identify um, and things like that. Um, it just wasn't a part of the culture, so to speak. But I will say, go. I started at Drew actually the same right after that summer of the summer when the Supreme Court ruled same-sex marriage. So that was really exciting. But to go to a school and just meet coworkers who are a part of the LGBTQIA community and open and comfortable and to see other coworkers who are not a part of the community, but still supportive, ultimately made me feel comfortable to just be me. And on top of that, I can be also be a great educator and my sexual orientation has nothing to do with me as an educator. And it was, it was nice to, to, to just fully be me and my personality. Great. So one of the things I wanted to mention was the, the Supreme Court decision that came up within the last year or so, which basically said you can't discriminate on to, against anyone as a job. And I know that some of our educators were always worried to come out because they were afraid they could get fired. Is that something either of you experienced or? I haven't experienced it, thankfully, because um, I am a younger educator, this is year mm -hmm. nine. But I do, I do have colleagues who have experienced that or colleagues even who are younger than me who said I had never, never felt the need to say anything at my previous schools, um, which is similar to how I did. I didn't feel like I would lose my job, but I just def ultimately didn't feel like it was something that needed to be exposed, so to speak. Right. Um, so, um, so you talked about being a younger educator. I want to talk a little bit about children. How early in your experiences do children identify differences? And then how to even begin then to bully other kids based on those differences, whether they're gender-based difference or gender expression-based differences or a boy or a girl, you know, bullying. How soon does that start based on your all's experiences? So, well, I have a three and a half year old and I can say that as soon as he can form sentences, <laughs> as soon as he could form sentences, he was, he could point out differences. It's just the understanding of how the child's brain works, same and different. Um, he even, we work through language of him saying things like, is this only for girls or can boys have it too? Um, I can't put my hair in a pony. He won't let me put his hair in a ponytail because he says it's only for girls. But he has really great curls for it. So <laughs> I think it, it, it definitely starts really young. And what I've also noticed is that parents play a role in that as well. I've heard parents say things like, I don't want my child playing with them because they, that boy likes pink or it wants to be a princess. And I think parents have few, can sometimes fuel um, what ignites in, in, in recognizing those same, um, those differences and also leading to bullying ultimately, um, just because they put a neg they can put a negative stigma on um, children being different or being themselves ultimately. Right, so thanks for that. And Jonathan, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely agree with Jasmine on that. You know, one thing I've realized, and Jasmine can say this, is that children are very attuned to everything. They can tell you if you're wearing the wrong socks, or they tell you if you have a stain on your shirt because you dropped yogurt. But at the end of the day, kids are aware, and they're aware who they are. And I think it all starts from home. But at the same time, I've seen early on kids who identify as transgender, and, and feeling like they're not, um, wanting to express that gender that they feel inside. So I've seen that at Drew when I was teaching there and I, and I always think of that particular student um, and how they eventually, as they continued on to uh, grade level wise, just to see that child become truly themselves and, mm -hmm. and really come to terms with that and having the support from their parents and, their, uh, and our admin, so. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I wanted to ask about is both as educators, if, how do you counter that in a classroom space? How do you make it a safe and welcoming space for your students and help to make the space feel safer for them? But then also after you said something, you said also set a light bulb, how do you talk to maybe the parents whose child may be bringing attitudes from home or do you talk to that parent? 
I think it's very important for educators to name their their space, their classroom that is your space as an inclusive space. Um, so it, it would be appropriate to address that if you felt comfortable, if you had the support of your administration or someone, counselors at your school to also help you have those, to navigate those tough conversations with parents who might be a little adverse to how you allow things to happen in your classroom. I definitely think you you have a, you should have a support system around that, but it is something that needs to be addressed so that we don't cultivate little people who just grow up with a lot of hate and anger towards things they may not understand or perceive as different. Mm -hmm. But I think way to uh, in making an inclusive classroom comes with knowing who's in your classroom, who's there, who's your audience, what do you know about your families, how are you getting to know them, and then thinking about what do you know about the child, how are you getting to know the child, um, mm -hmm. by making the child feel as, as they should feel like everyone else in the classroom, mm -hmm. you should make them feel how you would want to feel going to school, right. and I know I may not have all the, had the experience in elementary, middle, high school, feeling totally like myself, but if you, we definitely, I can say that uh, Jonathan and I are individuals who invite everyone into our rooms, um, make families feel comfortable. I have Courtney's son now and he's amazing and we we have great conversations and not not to be afraid to talk about, okay, well, do you, if you have two moms and that's, that's, you can talk about that. And we mm -hmm. say, well, families look different. This is a different, this is how families that have different types of makeups and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and to normalize it. So it doesn't become so mm -hmm. tough, really. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I would add on to, for me, when I was teaching, I would always make the class dojo class and let the kids like create their avatar to their uniqueness. Mm -hmm. um, and because every kid wants to have that ownership of who they express they want to be. And then mm -hmm. even being able to acknowledge the pronouns, especially, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to do sometimes. Um, you know, as an educator, you're like, is this right to do? Am I able to do this? You know, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, we all kids come in the classroom with a nickname. Mm -hmm. you know, they don't go by their first name, they go by their middle name, or if not, they go by what someone calls them at home. But, you know, allowing that makes a kid be able to be accepted and loved and then creating a space where it's not a traditional classroom where you're sitting on a desk and you're facing the, the, the front board but having spaces where kids can go anywhere and they can be in a safe space and make that space there. So, and then of course for me, I, I've always made an effort to, you know, put up my uh, my pride flag and then pictures of my family and, and then have a disco ball and then light. So, you know, it's all these fun things because at the end of the day, kids are gonna be invited to something that is not like they've never seen before. And it's creating an inclusive classroom as well. But I just realized we were talking about in-person classrooms. How about in the virtual environment, which we were talking about about before this session? How does that look virtually? Has to be is something our kids? How are kids interacting with each other? How are you as a teacher monitoring that? Those private chats that they can have. I'm just curious, actually. Yeah. Um, well, we it, it is harder to get to know students in the virtual learning environment definitely but what i think we're we've been really doing well with fourth grade is the tasks that we're giving them ask a lot of questions like would you prefer to do this or that and they explore that we did a, an entire project actually recently um in all subjects where they talked about identity was the purpose of their question and we looked at your identity in math your identity if you were a patriot or a loyalist and you love basketball and how would you argue with that from that perspective we looked at identity poems um, and how do, how are you shining on your community? Like, how are you a part of your community during a pandemic? What's something great that you're doing? So I think we have really taken into, how are we going to think outside the box to really get to know our students, um, outside of just talking in the chat or being in breakout rooms, what are we having them do that mm -hmm. gets them like to think and be excited? Like, oh, I get to finally show my teachers that I really like Robux. Well, awesome. Or I really like Fortnite. So that's mm -hmm. been really fun. Neat. Jonathan? Um, one of the cool things that we got to do this year, at least with when I work with teachers digitally, is that the kids were able to create their own digital backgrounds to express who they are. Oh, and man. so kind of like the background that I have right now, um, it was a thing where kids can just be able to have their name and, and be able to put things that express who they are 
And whether it's a rainbow, whether it's a unicorn, whatever they chose, it's something that they were able to have um, to be able to say, hey, this is me, and they show up to class. Because sometimes, you know, some, some of the kids, um, they don't know each other very well. And then if they see something like, oh, you like that or you'd like this, and then you get to know a little bit about them. So we got to do a little bit of a Zoom uh, background um, for the class. So that was pretty interesting. That was pretty cool. So what do the blobs in your background? <laughs> you know, I, I thought it looked nice. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I love it. It looks great. I was just wondering. Um, and then, so, I, yeah, because I remember there were instances of cyberbullying that we've had in my kids' schools. And so I didn't know if there was something um, that you all saw, but I love the way you were con connecting and helping kids to get to know each other and you as well as a new school year started with all new teachers. It must have been so hard. Um, so we talked, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned something about knowing your audience. We talked about creating allies. So how have you all created allies for the kids, with the parents, with the administration? How does that work? What have you seen that was really successful? and and what you've done well i mean i could say for me my goal has always been i have a funny last name and so i i think most kids have a hard have had a hard time saying zamarippa and they usually condense it to mr z but i always made sure that my kids knew my last name and then what that entailed was the kids are able to pronounce and correct their parents because at the end of the day the parents have they have a hard time with that but what ended up being is you build that relationship first with the students and you build that rapport and you build it to where they go home at night and they sit at the dinner table and they talk about what you do in robotics class or what you do oh we were in mr zamaripa's class and we did x y and z and so then of course you build that relationship with the kids and they go home and talk about about you and what you they did in class that was interesting and then you build that rapport with your colleagues mm -hmm. um you know your colleagues are the people that you see every day and the people that you engage and of course you're going to share um you know share ideas and share um things together and then admin of course you know building that friendship uh, building that so i think for me it's always been making sure that the kids are built having an understanding of who I am, but also be able to, you know, let the parents know, hey, you meet the parent for the first time. It's like, so you're that person that my kid's been talking about the whole time. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's been my approach um, in creating that community, mm -hmm. and it starts in the classroom with the children, and it built outwardly. Jasmine, I definitely agree with Jonathan. Um, also something that I think all educators should consider about all students is getting to know them for yourself. I know students who come from grade to grade, you can see the roster and another student can say, oh, you have that child or that family. And it is up to you to form opinions and to really get to know your students without the bias of another person. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to do that because you never know if that this is the year that the child has you and they have an excellent year or it's the year that changes everything for them and they have the best year of elementary middle high school that they've ever had mm -hmm. you really have to form your own opinions i like to tell every student that comes to my classroom this is the best math class you will ever be in like i'm very confident like this is the class to be in you're in the best class and they they take pride in that and they come to class every day um, excited to be here. And when people come in to visit, they're excited that other people get to come and see how great their math class is. And that allows everyone to feel more comfortable and to feel like themselves because they feel like they make this class great. It's not me that's making it great. It is great because you are here. And that's what I like to impose on my students for sure. Very nice. I wish I could take your math class. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Um, when we also, something else we talked about earlier, we talked about being mindful of your audience and being mindful of language. Um, can you unpack that a little for whoever's listening? And I think it's maybe pronouns. I think it's that pronoun conversation maybe. Um, so definitely recognizing the pronouns and using them correctly that the child wants to use or the child or the parents want to use. I think that's, that's respect first <laughs> like um, if that is what you the child or the family that's how they they choose to identify 
that's just being respectful, being a good human being. I also think as far as language goes, things we should get rid of as educators is saying, oh, well, mom and dad are going to replace it with caregivers and families and guardians. Um, grouping uh, boys on this side, girls on this side, group them by, if you want to go to the New York City or if you want to go to the Grand Canyon, group them differently to recognize um, a range of diversity and differences of opinions. So I think it, when we limit them to just a few categories, when children like all types of things, pepperoni, pizza, pineapple on pizza, mm -hmm. Owen and I like onions on our pizza, Courtney. So like <laughs> these are the different things that we have to, we have right. to consider when we're, when, when we are creating these inclusive environments, because if I don't feel like I can identify, or if I don't feel comfortable going into a box, a teacher definitely shouldn't make a student feel like they should have to. Right. No, I love that. That's a great way of doing it, dividing who likes pepperoni and who doesn't. Yeah. So any, Jonathan, any thoughts on language? Um, I mean, you know, Jasmine said some really good points. And I think, you know, I, I, I understand that for teachers that are coming into this, not knowing exactly where to start, we're all going to make mistakes. You know, it's not going to be easy. It's something that we're learning as we're going as a person that is trying to be an ally. Um, and yes, the best ally that you have is your friend that is an LGBTQI person and it's okay to go up to them and be like, hey, am I saying this right or am I doing this right? Because at the end of the day, we are welcoming people and we're going to be, okay, yeah, this is how you should have said it, mm -hmm. but it's okay. Um, so, you know, knowing that you're going to make a mistake, it's okay, but understanding that it's, you're working towards being an inclusive person in your classroom versus not making the effort. And right. So I think that's very important. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I'm glad to hear you said that. And also, so to take some of the fear of hurting feelings or stepping on toes, so where you don't approach somebody to ask the right way to talk to them um, as an educator or as a parent even, um, that as long as people are trying or show that they're trying um, and support the kids. Um, and so I know pronouns sometimes are the hardest things sometimes for um, parents, like for example, if you don't see a child very often, you may forget what their pronouns were or how they prefer to be referred to. Um, and I know there's a lot of anxiety among my, my parent groups around that. Am I getting it right? Um, am I saying the right thing? So, um, so thank you for that. Um, let's see. So um, one of the things I wanted to bring up is, of course, all children also need to be affirmed for who they are. And you all have spoken to that so eloquently, um, but also not who we think they should be. Um, if a child has a teacher that some a parent needs to talk to about affirming their child, how, what is the best way for an adult caregiver where they can positively advocate for their child in a classroom space? What do you think are good ways to start so that you can positively advocate? advocate for your kid? I think you should start by just telling your child's teacher who your child is. You know who your child is at home. Explain to them, how are you talking? How do they talk about themselves at home? How are you addressing them at home? So that that, that carries into school because kids spend time at school and home for the most part. Um, teachers are around their uh, students as, as much as parents are at times. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the first thing. Um, <laughs> Sorry, um, that's the first thing that you have to do. You really have to affirm that this is who my child is. This is how we talk about them at home. We are comfortable with it and we want you to be comfortable with it as well. You have to have that open candid conversation and children want to see and they want to be seen. So seeing, um, seeing individuals in their school that they can identify with is really important and also making sure your, your child's teacher can see them. Like this is who they are you know, let me know if they're having a hard time with X at school, um, as far as how they are developing socially and emotionally, that's really important for all parents to consider because that really, this really plays on that social emotional development of a child. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, anything to add to that? Well, I mean, Justin said some really good points, but I also would also say that, you know, I understand that that is not the case for most parents in our country. Wherein, you know, and the realization is that that parent would have to be the advocate for their community, their district, their school, you know, and just knowing that there's a network of people out there already who have done it or doing it 
and knowing that you're not alone in this. And I, and I, especially I speak on that in the mindset of our transgender children whose parents are trying to figure everything out at the same time with their kids and trying to figure out how is my kid going to be accepted in the classroom? Are there going to be inclusive bathrooms or any of that? So it's just knowing that you're not alone and that you can find the resources that are available for you to get you started to be the advocate for your community, your school, your district, whatever, because our country, you know, it's, it's, it's big and there are communities still that have certain issues uh, against that, so. Thank you. So I just want to remind anybody, if you have a question, please pop it into the chat. Um, we have just a few minutes left. And I want to share, you mentioned resources. So um, we got some resources and put them up on slides. And um, our, our behind the scenes elf is going to bring them up. Um, these were shared with us by Courtney, but um, maybe Jonathan can talk about Glisten. Um, so one of them is a cult of pedagogy, which is about great resource materials from classroom management to curriculum to attitude adjustments for teachers of LGBTQ kids or LGBTQ teachers. Um, do you want to talk about GLSEN a little bit? Was it you mentioned that or? Um... Uh, me? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Jonathan. I just realized I, I'm looking, at, from my point of view, I'm looking at you. <laughs> well, it's fine. Um, I think <laughs> we, you know, GLSEN's been around since I was in high school. It was used to, it used to be um, the, what's now just GLSEN. It used to be an acronym, Gay Lesbian Student Net, uh, Educator Network. Um, and so they've continued this this trajectory where they've picked up data, they've picked up really informative information packets and stuff for resources for parents and educators. Um, but for me, it's the what I really love about it is just the data that you see is that they they put it out that we are still you know kids who are transgender or gay or or lesbian or in the scope of our. Um, community, they still face discrimination. And it's so interesting that we are lacking behind, especially here in our state, and then just and other areas of our country that, you know, they we still need that policy and that change so that we don't have issues moving forward for any student, that, whether it's from elementary, middle, or high school. So I think they have a really good network of stuff there. So I'm definitely um, proud of that, what they've been doing. Um, and then there's the Global Alliance scale um, for um, LGBTQ education. And then another one is a great organization that I love called Live Out Loud, which helps to inspire and empower LGBTQ youth. So these are all great resources and they will be posted on the blog post so you can find them later with all their lovely websites um, to share. Um, I want to thank you both so much, oh my God, for joining us and taking time out of your day um, to do this. I know, especially since you are all, both probably on Zoom 24 seven as educators. So thank you so much. Um, and thanks to our audience for joining us as well. Um, please follow our Town Square series and join us next Thursday for a very exciting conversation with Ryan Romerman and Ashley Rebess of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. They are gonna talk about the current legal landscape for LGBTQI a children and adults, um, both as impact their lives in school and also out in the world. And um, any last words, Jonathan or Jasmine, that you want to share? No, again, just thank you, Karen, for having me. Um, this was really great to just talk about things that I'm passionate about. So thank you. Thank you. And I say the same thing to you, Karen, and thank you, Courtney, for um, nominating us to be a part of this little discussion. And just again, like Jasmine said, we are passionate. These are things that we're passionate about, right. and we hope to inspire others to do the same. Right, and um, thank you so much. And um, Courtney, I think you're on this. If you want to pop in and wave hi and just be acknowledged for your work on this, I'd love that. Um, I know you had your kid in your lap earlier. Yes, I did. I just wanted to say thank you to um, Jonathan and Jasmine as well. You guys are fabulous educators, and. Um, it takes fabulous educators to sometimes draw attention to um, marginalized populations. So I appreciate your work. Thanks. And thanks um, to everybody. Um, I hope everyone has a lovely evening and a lovely day. So um, thank you. <laughs>